From the Lower Colorado River Authority, this is Wavelength. The creation of this new river authority will help electrify rural Texas. And so today, we gather here to dedicate this mighty structure for Canada. But this has been a great organization for 60 years. It's going to be a great organization for a long time to come. Hi everyone, welcome to the February 2001 edition of Wavelength. Well, with skyrocketing electricity prices and rolling blackouts in California, many people here are wondering just what's in store as we prepare to restructure the electric power industry here in Texas. Well, one key difference between California and Texas comes down to the old law of supply and demand. So unlike California, we still have a surplus, a pretty healthy surplus. Uh, California is, uh, ha hasn't built a, a new generation uh, plant uh, in 10 years and as a result are overly dependent on out-of-state uh, resources to meet their growing demand. Lost Pines 1 here in Bastrop is just one of several generating plants being built in Texas today. In fact, by this summer, an additional 10,000 megawatts of generating capacity will have come online in Texas since the beginning of 2000. Lost Pines 1 is a 540 megawatt combined cycle plant being built by LCRE affiliate Gentex Power Corporation and its partner Calpine Corporation. A major construction milestone was reached here in early January when Austin Energy completed the switchyard which ties the generating plant to the transmission system. This also allows plant systems and equipment to be energized and tested. One of the advantages we have in working with Calpine on the project is they do have a startup group that goes from one plant to the next uh, and become very proficient in starting up these combined cycle plants. Uh, as Zachary completes systems, they turn them over formally to Calpine startup group who uh, actually energizes motors and electrical systems and starts uh, pumps and th does all the uh, things that have to be done to get things ready to start generating power. Look for the first combustion turbine to be fired up by the end of February with commercial operations of the plant scheduled for June 1st. When Lost Pines 1 comes online, it will produce power much more efficiently than traditional gas-fired plants. And that's great news considering natural gas prices in Texas have jumped more than 400% since 1999. Nationally, low levels of stored gas coupled with record cold temperatures in the eastern United States this winter caused gas prices to skyrocket. The LCRA has been able to deal with this gas crisis better than many other utilities for several reasons. First is LCRA's diverse generation mix, which includes coal, gas, hydro, and wind energy. Coal units, gas units, the wind, the hydro, everything that we have available is right here in front of us to dispatch right here. And here at LCRA's Wholesale Energy Trading Center, the generation desk is staffed 24-7 constantly matching electrical output with customer demand. At the same time, we're measuring whether or not we have surplus to sell out in the market, hour to hour, uh, day to day, based on our forecast of, of temperature and, and customer demand. Conversely, if demand is greater than the facilities that we have uh, available to generate electricity, we'll be out in the market buying energy uh, at, at the most economical means to meet our customers' demand. So they do both buying and selling, um, hour to hour, day to day. Just down the hall, these financial planners monitor fuel options and futures, trying to keep LCRA positioned favorably in an ever-changing market. Another hedge against high gas prices can be found here at Sim Gideon Power Plant in Bastrop. These storage tanks hold thousands of gallons of fuel oil, which can be used to supplement gas or replace it. It's been approximately 10 years since we fired any major quantities of fuel oil here at, at Sim Gideon. We do practice continuously each year to be able to fire fuel oil when necessary, either for curtailments or, in this case, for the economic benefit that, that exists. 
LCRA also has the ability to store huge quantities of natural gas here at the Hillbig Gas Storage Facility in Bastrop County. All of these factors and many other efficiencies have kept LCRA's fossil fuel costs the lowest among ERCOT utilities for the past 10 years, and that's good news for Central Texas. I hereby convene this meeting. Of the New board, board chair Pamela Aikens gaveled her first official board meeting to order in January. I'm deeply honored to serve as chair of the Lower Colorado River Authority with this outstanding board and staff. I know that each of us takes our responsibility very seriously and works extremely hard at serving the people of Central Texas. Gail Linke of Fayette County is vice chair and Bob Lambert of Llano County is board secretary. Our discussion item is the agreement with the San Antonio water system. Just five days after their regular meeting, board members were back in Austin for a special session to consider an historic agreement with San Antonio Water System to develop the first major water resources in the Colorado River Basin since the LCRA started construction of the Highland Lakes dams over 60 years ago. This contract would change the way we do business. This is the first time that a statewide water planning effort will lead to two basins sharing resources in a way that leaves both basins better off. It is the win-win that we have always looked for. The proposal calls for storing excess river flows in off-channel ponds to be constructed downriver from Austin. It also calls for aggressive conservation measures in the rice irrigation districts and using groundwater for irrigation in the coastal region during droughts. The new water resources that would be generated would serve irrigation needs, allow the levels of Lakes Buchanan and Travis to be higher during severe drought, and serve municipal users in San Antonio and area cities, as well as rural communities in the western part of the Colorado River Basin. The contract calls for environmental impact studies to be conducted before any final commitment can take place. And this is a, an historic day where we can ensure the water supply for our basin and the quality of life in our basin, as well as implementing the Senate Bill 1 planning process and showing that two regions can work together to achieve a mutual goal. And I thank everyone. And if there are no other comments, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. You've done a great thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give a round of applause to yeah. Here, here. For years now, the LCRA and the City of Austin have teamed up to fight the invasion of non-native aquatic weeds, such as this Eurasian water milfoil, known locally as duckweed. Every other winter, at the city's request, LCRA lowers Lake Austin by 12 feet, thus exposing the milfoil to freezing temperatures, hopefully drying it out. This process has been fairly successful in controlling the milfoil. But now, there's a new threat lurking just beneath the surface and crawling along the banks of Lake Austin. It's hydrilla. Like milfoil, hydrilla was brought into this country as an aquarium plant in the 1960s. It's now been found in 80 different lakes in Texas, often being transported from one to the other on boat trailers and propellers. Hydrilla was first discovered in Lake Austin in 1999, covering approximately 20 acres of service area. Last summer, it had spread to over 200 acres. That's in addition to the 200 acres of milfoil already in the lake. Well, I think the important thing to remember with hydrilla is it's not going to take just one thing. There is no magic potion or silver bullet that's going to take care of this problem. It's an exotic plant. It's a very aggressive um, weed, and it's going to take an integrated plan, um, as many different things as are appropriate to use for control options. Those control options include mechanical means, such as a harvester or lake drawdowns biological control such as sterile grass carp that eat the weeds, and chemical control such as aquatic herbicides. The Commodore has been operating on Lake Austin since 1949. Dudley Fowler took over the paddle wheeler from his father 
and over the years they have helped thousands of people celebrate birthdays, weddings, reunions, and anniversaries while cruising the waters of Lake Austin. Right now, while the lake is down, the boats are being spruced up for next season, a season Fowler hopes will not be ruined by hydrilla. This is a genuine threat to the health of this lake, and it's a threat to the ambiance of the city of Austin. And it's a, it's a threat to the, to the tourists that we have coming here. Um, it, uh, uh, we're just not going to have any lake if, 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 this is, if the grass carp are not put in it. That's all there is to it. Officials at Texas Parks and Wildlife have so far refused requests by the city of Austin to introduce the sterile grass carp into Lake Austin, saying that the hydrilla infestation has not yet reached what they call crisis proportions. Hydrilla is much more invasive and harder to control than milfoil, but both plants can choke out and displace native vegetation. You know, what we're looking for is a balance where we, we don't want to remove all the vegetation. We know Lake Austin, in order to be a healthy ecosystem, needs to have some amount of um, aquatic vegetation. The concern that the city and certainly many other people, LCRA and the um, landowners and the other recreational users of the lake have, is that we're gonna, we have too much vegetation. City crews remove what hydrilla and milfoil they can get to here at City Park. Some lake residents have put down weed barriers, hoping to impede regrowth of the weeds around swim areas and boat docks. River managers at the LCRA fear that hydrilla will migrate from Lake Austin through Town Lake and into the river below Austin. And our biggest concern is if it gets into our irrigation system down at the lower end. Uh, a comparison here would be to what has happened to the irrigation system over on the Rio Grande. The hydrilla got into that and they're fighting that very difficultly right now and uh, they haven't come up with any really good solutions. So we have a, a great concern in the water management business here of that hydrilla affecting what we're doing to provide water to our users, not only in the irrigation district, but other users downstream. Scientists from the city of Austin, LCRA, and Texas Parks and Wildlife will monitor the hydrilla in Lake Austin closely. They agree it will take a comprehensive, coordinated effort to control these exotic weeds. The LCRA will refill Lake Austin starting February 12th. Water will pass through hydro generators at Mansfield Dam, helping to meet peak electrical demands. The process will take three to five days and will drop the level of Lake Travis less than one foot. Webster's Dictionary defines the word safe as being free from danger or injury or unharmed. And here at the LCRA, it is our ultimate goal to have every single employee return to their families each night safely. In the past decade, there have been tremendous improvements in the corporate safety record at the LCRA. Nowhere is that change more evident than here at the Fayette Power Project in LaGrange, where employees have just achieved a major safety milestone of working two million hours without a lost time accident. When you look back over the 39 months that it's taken us to accumulate this two million safe worker hours, there's been a tremendous amount of significant accomplishments. There have been some near misses. We've had some major happenings here from explosions and fires to uh, uh, turbine problems to outages to overhauls to day-by-day -day work. And it's taken the total concentration and cooperation of every one of us to be able to get through those activities the way that we have. And I commend you for that. And it's that that uh, we're here to, to celebrate today. In 1991, FPP employees suffered through a record 19 lost time accidents. It has taken a tremendous commitment from management and employees to make safety such an integral part of everyday life. I came here 14 years ago and saw the stats, how high they were, and really never thought that this goal would be achieved. And, and I'm just very proud of the folks here. Uh, they work daily to to do their work as safe as they can. Our committee is very uh, involved and strong. Uh, and after folks rotate off that committee, they have learned quite a lot about safety. So they be, they've become my uh, safety eyes and ears, as well as the management team's here's eyes and ears in the, in the plants to, to help us 
keep our workforce safe every day. Thank you, and again, congratulations. This achievement was also acknowledged at the January board meeting with an official resolution and praise from individual board members. The fact that these, these folks had that power plant at, at basically full generating capacity almost constantly and still created an atmosphere where they had no lost time accidents is really quite outstanding. Um, and, and I think we need to recognize them not just for their safety record, which is outstanding, but for their dedication in keeping what we do, which is power generation, going at the best price we can do it. And I think that's important too. Currently, there are several examples of outstanding safety records, such as Tensco Construction. These crews build the substations and transmission lines that deliver the power to our customers. This May will make five years since their last lost time accident. We look at our task. Uh, we know we have some risk that, that we incur every day in performing our jobs. We ask the employees to, to realize that uh, those tasks can be done safely. Uh, we have the equipment and the means to do them safely. And so taking that in consideration and pointing those facts out, uh, uh, the supervisors uh, pointing that out to employees, we feel like the employees are taking better care of themselves. The 37 employees at the Thomas C. Ferguson plant in Marble Falls have recently completed 13 years and well over 1 million hours of safe operations. Hydro employees are also safety millionaires with 1.2 million safe worker hours to their credit. By the way, Hydro holds the all-time record for any work group at the LCRA with 3 million safe worker hours, an amazing mark set back in the mid-1980s. Now the LCRA is launching a new safety awareness program aimed at recognizing and reporting near misses. A near miss or close call is any unsafe condition or unsafe act that could result in an accident or injury. I really see this as a, an important program for folks because I really do think that people can learn from near misses. I think we all do that, with, you know, whether you're in a car or at home and you have a close call, you learn from that. And that can be shared with other employees so that they can learn the same lessons. And I think we can really reduce the number of, of incidents out there. Safety experts use this pyramid to illustrate how accidents can happen. First, an unsafe act or condition, followed by a minor injury, serious injury, and fatality. The goal of reporting is to stop at the near-miss level. You can totally prevent loss at all these other levels. This is important because if we can learn about what causes accidents by uh, this near-miss program and this reporting program, then we can do something to uh, change and not actually have an accident. As general manager, I can promise you that uh, you will never be punished for reporting a, a near miss or an unsafe condition or an unsafe act. This is something you're gonna be expected to do because it can make us all be able to work in a safer place. The Corporate Environmental and Safety Department is in the process of distributing near miss training programs to all LCRA lines of business with the goal of reaching every single employee. As Austin continues to grow and develop, surrounding communities are also affected. Often, smaller towns can be overwhelmed trying to provide basic services such as water, wastewater, and electricity to that growing population. Just a few years ago, this wastewater plant in Elgin was struggling to meet state standards and had no more capacity for growth. That's when city officials went looking for help. This ceremony officially dedicated the $2.3 million upgrade and expansion of Elgin's wastewater treatment system. In a creative partnership agreement, the LCRA purchased the plant from Elgin in 1997 and started the upgrade process. I think that uh, when you deal with a smaller city with limited resources like we have here in Elgin, you have to count on other people. You have to count on a partnership. Elgin, as Joe alluded to, I think we're beyond the threshold. In fact, we're into a significant growth period. 
And I think that uh, if the economy holds and uh, things continue, that the next 10, 15 years are going to be very significant years in the life of this community. And of course, this facility is an essential part of that growth. LCRA's role in providing water and wastewater services throughout the region has increased tremendously in the past few years. It's all part of LCRA's mission to protect the environment, especially the water quality of the Colorado River. We are here to serve the rural part of Central Texas, and as the water quality requirements have increased over time, it has become more and more difficult for rural communities like Elgin to be able to afford to keep up with the water quality requirements. The city of Elgin has done all of the right things. They have persevered, uh, and together as a team, we have brought this plant to fruition, and it's something that everybody here ought to be extremely proud of. This new wastewater treatment plant has provided us with double the capacity we had previously on a, on a plant that was out of permit. And so consequently now, uh, we have a plant that meets all of the state guidelines uh, through the efforts of LCRA, and now we can grow and grow orderly, and that's a very tremendous thing for the city of Elgin. Elgin has been behind the curve for years and, and now we're back up to speed and we're, we're happy about this what's going on today. Three new subdivisions just west of Elgin with a total of 400 homes will all be served by the new wastewater plant. There are many holidays that are celebrated in America. There's President's Day, the 4th of July, and Memorial Day just to name a few. But one of the more recent additions has been to celebrate the life of one of the most influential civil rights leaders of American history. It's a person that has very special meaning to LCRA's Yvonne Davis. Standing here next to the statue of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a statue that stands watch over the University of Texas campus, I can't help but recall that just a few decades ago, African Americans, just like me, were not allowed to attend this university because of the color of their skin. But today, my heart stands proud, humbled, challenged, and forever thankful for the life, legacy, and teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It was a very chilly January morning as LCRA employees gathered at the general office complex to celebrate the Martin Luther King holiday. I was so moved by General Manager Joe Bill's words reflecting on his own life and the change that took place. I had been taught all of my life how to treat people, and I had been taught wrong. My folks, I assume, were taught by their folks, and they in turn taught me as their child, and they taught me a culture that was wrong and because of the activities of Martin Luther King and and others uh, like him that uh, took it upon themselves to try to change the culture within the US then I was able to change after Joe's speech we all got on buses and I couldn't help but think about when just not too long ago Rosa Parks a woman just like me would have been forced to get on the back of the bus, but today we're all singing and sitting together. I was overwhelmed when we arrived at Houston Tillerson College. The music was so invigorating and got my heart really pumping to see the thousands of people from all different cultures and walks of life. The march to the Capitol only lasted about an hour, and it was just long enough for people to think about the efforts of Dr. King and to appreciate the miles that he walked for all of us. I was so inspired by the David Houston family who came all the way with their friends from LaGrange to join us in this important event. I have a dream. My dream is that uh, we all can, can one day overcome this, this uh, racism, if you will, but uh, at the same time, if all we have to do is just believe in one another, and I think we can overcome that. They even brought their children to get them personally involved in the march. For me, walking down the street, I thought about how Dr. Martin Luther King, had, what he had to go through, and all the things that he did for us, because if it weren't for him, 
we might not all be able to join hands like we did this morning. And I thought to myself, what a wonderful legacy to pass along to your children and grandchildren. And to see people like J.B. Payne and Robert Cullock, two men from very different backgrounds, marching together today as brothers. And I appreciate him for who he is. Now the fact is he's had also ter terrific experiences and some things that I have not had to, uh, to challenges I have not had to overcome. And that makes him a very strong person. So I turn to people like JB when I need strength and when I need somebody who has a different point of view than my own. What I remember was in Memphis, I actually marched with Dr. King in Memphis. And, uh, and uh, so whenever I do this, you know, I, I do it in, 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 in remembrance of, of that time. As we arrived at the Capitol, the crowd had grown to nearly 20,000 people. His life was about making America live up to its truest ideals. We listened to speeches. I was reminded of how Dr. King called on all Americans to live up to the true meaning of the Constitution, a Constitution that is a living and breathing document. Leaving the march, I felt so inspired, hopeful, and even more committed to the teachings of Dr. King. An even more fitting tribute to Dr. King came at the January board meeting as the board of directors voted to make MLK Day an official LCRA holiday. I felt so proud at that moment to be an employee of the LCRA. So when I reflect upon this day and all of the celebrations that took place, I especially want to thank the LCRA's management and all of its employees as we join the nation and our city to celebrate the birthday, the life, and teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Right now, I'd like to introduce Krista Umshide Mount Joy. Krista is going to be joining us here on Wavelengths, reporting news and events from all around the company. Many of you probably already know Krista. She's been with LCRA nearly seven years with the Corporate Communications Department and is currently the editor of the LCRA News. Thanks, Richard. I'm really looking forward to joining the Wavelengths team. I see you have the current LCRA News uh, in your hand there. What's in this issue? Well, for the January-February news, you can read what Joe Beal has to say about his first year as Elsery's general manager. There's also an article on Elsery's power plants and the great job they're doing keeping costs down and reliability up. And you can read about the 77th legislative session and what key issues are important to the LCRA. All that and much, much more in the January-February LCRA news.